Welcome to this special occasion, the Robertson Lecture of the Residential College. I am Catherine Badgley, Director of the Residential College and faculty member in the science program. We are delighted that so many of you are here today to hear about this important topic of mental health of college students. The Robertson Lecture is named in honor of the first director of the Residential College. James Robertson was a professor in the English department and part of the original planning committee for the RC in the mid 1960s. These were turbulent times in the United States and at the University of Michigan with fierce debates about the war in Vietnam, racism in society and environmental degradation with many counterparts today. The planning committee was committed to creating a new kind of educational experience one that created lasting connections between faculty and students that enabled students to have a large role in shaping their own educational experience and that connected college education to the world at large. Many of the qualities created by the founders of the RC remain at its core today, including commitment to self-expression, to learning proficiency in a foreign language, to social justice, and to experiential courses taught by dedicated faculty. Fortunately, James Robertson lived long enough to attend the 20th anniversary of the residential college and to see that this bold experiment was flourishing and still is. He wrote that his experience as a teacher and administrator at the RC were the most satisfying of his career. In 2011, the Robertson family established the James H. and Jean B. Robertson Memorial Lecture to address topics in education and the liberal arts. Before I introduce our moderator for today, I would like to thank Liz Goodenow, who has spearheaded this entire event and who will make closing remarks in about an hour. And now I am very pleased to introduce Judy Gardner, the moderator of this afternoon's presentation. Judy grew up in Detroit and graduated from the University of Michigan Dearborn with a bachelor's degree in education and a specialized certificate in training design and development. After spending seven years working in the Washington DC area, her passion for nonprofit work was ignited and led to over 25 years of experience in the nonprofit sector. She is currently the executive director of the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill of Washtenaw County, a role that she has held for five years. And she has worked for, with NAMI for 12 years in total. Judy, let me turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Catherine. And thank you all for joining us this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to remind folks to please post uh, questions in the Q&A and that this um, uh, webinar will be recorded. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon. Our keynote is Joseph Bean, PhD. He is the Dean of the Wellness Center at the School of, of the Art Institute of Chicago and has been on staff since 1994. He received his master's in science and PhD in clinical psychology with a subspecialty in medical psychology from the University yeah. of Florida exactly. and a BA in psychology from the University of Michigan. So we would like to welcome Joe Ian. Welcome, Joe. Welcome, Carl's toolbox. Hey, thanks, everybody. Uh, it's a genuine to honor to be uh, um, talking with you know, all. Could be some in with, one of I'm getting a little background noise. Or even if you go downstairs and go you know, to the right. I think we might have to have someone who's borrow one. one. Thanks, everyone. It's a genuine honor to be selected to give the Robertson Lecture, uh, especially as a U of M alum. Uh, I'm just delighted to be here. I, I only wish that I could be there in person, but uh, circumstances being what they are, it's great to have you all here. And I, I, I can see from the attendee list that people are from uh, far-flung places gathering today, and that's exciting and one of the opportunities that comes with these Zoom experiences. And, and thanks, Judy, for the introduction. I'm looking forward to doing this panel with you too today. Uh, so again, my name is Joe Behan. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and his, and I'm a clinical psychologist and the Dean of the Wellness Center at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where I've been for the past 27 years. Uh, SAIC is a leading school of art and design, uh, one of 40 plus uh, such schools in North America. All, we're all part of the Association of Independent Colleges of Art and Design. 
the way to think of these schools is uh, if, if you know you want to be an artist, if, if, if that's just an obvious thing to you as a teenager, these are great schools to attend. It's a highly immersive experience. Uh, you get connected to faculty or leading artists uh, in their fields. And, uh, and, and, and I've fallen in love with the place. I never thought I'd end up at an art school, but like I say, I've been here for the past 27 years. And here at SAIC, we're, we're also uh, an art school that's on the cutting edge of the art world, where our students are encouraged to push boundaries, to realize new visions, uh, to develop a personal artistic vision that they carry out throughout their lives. And I think you'll hear some of that spirit in what I'm talking about today in terms of college student mental health and health. You know, I'm an administrator, a scientist practitioner. I'm very active in college uh, student health and mental health efforts. Uh, I graduated in 89 from U of M with a bachelor's in psychology. Uh, I grew up in Detroit in a large working class family, the sixth of eight kids. Uh, my youngest sister had Down syndrome uh, and that experience of uh, growing up close to someone with a disability uh, is something that's influenced my work uh, throughout my time here at SAIC. Uh, I identify as a first, college, first generation college student. You know, when I was in college, I don't recall that designation being used so much. It felt that way. I know what it feels like to be a first gen student. And as first generation students are identified as a population of students in need of support. Uh, in, in these days, uh, you know, I, I identify in such a way and here at our school, our faculty and staff who are first gen students identify so that we can serve as mentors to our first gen students. Uh, I attended Michigan on a Michigan competitive scholarship, which at the time was based on an ACT score and financial need. It provided full tuition, which I think then was about $2,000 a year in state. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to attend without it. Uh, and I left Michigan with very little debt as a result of that. And I, I share this in part just to highlight the kind of support that's been there in the past that I don't know that is so much there in the present and something collectively we can all work toward is trying to make sure that students with financial need get the support they uh, deserve to get through college these days. You know, I decided to pursue psychology while taking Howard Wolowitz's psychopathology course. He was a brilliant psychoanalyst known for his extraordinary lectures. Uh, at the same time, I was participating in project outreach. Uh, we were going to the Ypsilanti State Psychiatric Hospital and socializing with the men on the men's chronic ward. It was an experience I'll never forget. And the combination of Wolowitz's brilliant theoretical formulations and uh, the men's needs on that chronic ward uh, convinced me that psychology and clinical psychology would be a worthwhile path. I took courses with Tony Morris, who was known for his large introductory to psychology courses. And I also got to take a class with him my senior year where it was really just five students and Tony. Uh, we all uh, dived into the collective works of one personality theorist. That mine was Harry Stack Sullivan. Uh, and those readings still uh, uh, influence the way I think about the world and, and the work I'm doing now. Uh, Naomi Lohr had an amazing clinical perspective class that convinced me that that was the, uh, the path for me. And I even took one RC course in my last semester. I got a copy of my transcript just to make sure what it was. It was interdisciplinary studies. I think it, uh, Humanities 340. And uh, we read Kierkegaard and uh, humanism and existentialism, and uh, it was a great way to top off my experience at U of M. You know, I worked, did work study jobs in zoology, cleaning test tubes and psychology, coding studies for Nancy Kanner and David Buss. Uh, but my, the, the money that I needed to get through school beyond the scholarship came from a, a waiting and bartending job at Ashley's Pub, which I know is still going strong there on State Street. Uh, I went to University of Florida right out of graduate school, uh, studied clinical and health psychology, and came to Chicago to get my internship at the Northwestern Medical School, uh, and have stayed in, in Chicago since. I get to come back just about annually to U of M uh, for a brilliant research to practice symposium in the School of Public Health sponsored by the Healthy Minds Network, an economist, Daniel Eisenberg, who for a long time was a professor at U of M. He's recently moved to UCLA. But he delivers the, the best research out there on college student mental health through his Healthy Mind study. He's been an amazing collaborator for me over the past decade or so. And uh, uh, it, it's wonderful that Michigan and UCLA and 
uh, school out in Boston are all centers now for the Healthy Mind Study. If you don't know about it, it's something to definitely check out. Uh, you know, Michigan really does uh, reach the leaders and best ideal when it comes to college student mental health. I'll just point out a few things you have there. The U of M Depression Center, the First of Its Kind, the Annual Depression on Campus Conference, the Center for Positive Organizations, the Wolverine Support Network. You've got a brilliant counseling service led by Todd Sebig, who's one of the leaders in the field. Uh, if you're a student at Michigan, there is a lot to engage to make a difference in terms of your peers' college student uh, mental health. So the talk today is uh, called College Student Mental Health at the Edge, a conversation about compassion, equity, and art making amidst unprecedented levels of distress. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but I'm just gonna point out a few things to get us started. First, we are dealing now with unprecedented levels of college student distress. This was true pre-pandemic and it's been heightened by the challenges of the pandemic. And I'd add to this that uh, all members of the college community are impacted in this way now with uh, levels of distress that we've never seen before, which uh, is true. And there's an opportunity in that to collectively through public health approaches address uh, the needs of folks on campuses. You know, a second point ever, there's an ever increasing appreciation that if you as a campus have a goal to positively impact the well being of your student population, it is essential to center the needs of those most marginalized, stigmatized, and oppressed. Uh, and this is emerging as a, a, a core principle uh, in college student health and mental health now like never before. So there's tremendous opportunity to, to, to work with those who are, are marginalized the most and to make a, a significant difference on a campus. And the third thing I wanna highlight is that compassion activation cultivation and practice are especially helpful in improving compassion in improving campus well-being. Uh, we all suffer. Uh, we're going to suffer at one point or another. Those who are suffering at any particular time benefit when other people try to help them. Those who try to help benefit and a virtuous circle gets created and, and, and compassion as a practice becomes a major uh, uh, impact on well-being on any on any campus and and the science of compassion that's evolving now is a great guide for developing uh, practices on campus to cultivate compassion. So I'm going to talk and just give you kind of some information about four things we've done with particular populations on our campus, uh, which will kind of fuel the panel discussion that we'll have later, uh, as you can compare and contrast what you know other schools are doing, including Michigan. And I'm going to talk about suicide prevention. Uh, disability justice and awareness, uh, transgender student health and well being, and equity, mental health equity for BIPOC uh, students, students of color. So, soon, I'll start with suicide prevention. You know, in 2011, we received a three year Garrett Lee Smith campus suicide prevention grant from SAMHSA. Uh, it was $306,000. Uh, and it allowed us to build a suicide prevention infrastructure on our campus. And interestingly, we just applied for one again last year, missed by a single point, we just learned that. So we're gonna track again next year and see if we can land it. Uh, it. It was extraordinarily helpful in us developing that infrastructure. Back then the grants focused on mental health promotion. And for us that meant implementing widespread mental health first aid training and creating a wellness center student support network for students who trained in mental health first aid. The grant also allowed us to develop and enhance a comprehensive public health approach to student well-being. Uh, you know, it's interesting, the past 15 to 20 years, you know, college student mental health has developed as a kind of informal field uh, with the emergence of advocacy organizations like Active Minds, the Jed Foundation, the Steve Fund, and, and, and major research efforts uh, like the Healthy Minds Network that I described earlier in the Center for Collegiate Mental Health. And the, engage, the engagements of these things supports building a public health approach to student well-being on a campus. And you know, a number of these efforts were born out of the loss of a college student family member to suicide. Uh, a tragedy occurred with these students. Family members uh, engaged that loss and developed a movement. And, and collectively, these things have transformed college student mental health in a dramatic way. Uh, uh, not just the provision of counseling services and therapy on a campus, which are essential and we, we can't get enough of that, 
but a, a, a comprehensive approach to student well-being is, is evolved out of these efforts. And you know, you have, you know, part of this this series. Uh, the first part had to do with a, a wonderful film, uh, Why Fight. Uh, and if you are only hearing about it now, make sure you see this film because, in the same spirit, that work that it's a brilliant work. I, I had a chance to see it recently myself. Uh, born out of the loss of a family member, and uh, has the potential for emerging into something very, very significant that goes beyond uh, U of M uh, and impacts uh, these issues uh, well, well beyond the campus. In terms of disability justice and awareness, at SAIC, our work in suicide prevention helped inspire significant philanthropy focused on support for students with disabilities. You know, people with disabilities face massive challenges with stigma on college campuses. There's pervasive ableism on all campuses. And, you know, we've had the benefit of uh, several years of six-figure uh, philanthropy that's allowed us to increase the engagement. And, and we developed a mission with this, these resources. And the mission was uh, by increasing the engagement with the challenges of students with disabilities and cultivating compassion across SAIC, we can ensure a sense of belonging for every SAIC student. Our plan has had two primary goals. One, to enhance peer support for students with disabilities. And two, to increase faculty and staff awareness of and engagement with student disability issues. And we, we've done this so uh, successfully that last year we received two seven-figure uh, uh, philanthropic gifts that have allowed us to create an endowed fund to continue this work in perpetuity. And the kind of work that we get to do with these resources are training. So we've done compassionate leadership trainings with the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute. We've done compassion cultivation training uh, out of using the Stanford C Care model, the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. Uh, you know, our newly designed, redesigned wellness center serves as an exhibition space. Uh, we are intentional in making sure it could when we redesigned it. And we have we've done a number of exhibitions exploring compassion and belonging, a disability experience. We have an, uh, an alum here who's developed a vo something called the Voices Embodied uh, Project, which is uh, featured several shows in our wellness center and beyond. Our alum is Alex Stark, a brilliant young emerging curator and artist. Uh, we've created a network of peer support, our alliance of students with disabilities. Any student registered with a disability in our campus is invited to uh, uh, an ongoing uh, meeting uh, where we gather, eat lunch, and talk about how we can improve support for students with disabilities on our campus. We've done a theatrical performance with Erasing the Distance. We've created videos and short films. Uh, every year we bring in visiting artists uh, who are leaders in disability arts and culture, uh, both individually and in the organizations that they may lead. And, and the leadership is global. We've uh, brought people in internationally. Uh, we've created paid internships. Uh, uh, one, one example would be with our mayor's office for people with disabilities, we've created an internship. Uh, and you know what's interesting about this work? So we did the suicide prevention work for a few years with these funds. And now this disability awareness work with, with the suicide prevention work nowadays there's an entire menu that you can select from to impact your campus uh, of programs and efforts you can engage when it comes to disability justice and awareness is not the case uh, there's just not the same and i think that has to do with what's really an entrenched uh, stigmatization of people with disabilities on college campuses that we really try to fight against and advocate against but we've had to kind of create our own menu of options and our own approach which is liberating in one way, but uh, challenging in another. Uh, so an, another focus of our efforts has been transgender student health and well-being. You know, an outstanding feature of the SAIC student population is the comparatively large percentage of transgender and gender non-binary students. You're gonna find this across our schools. Uh, our wellness center received an American College Health Foundation Innovative Practices Grant to educate and develop a model training program for counseling and health staff about transgender issues to ensure that they are knowledgeable about transgender concerns and sensitive to the needs of transgender students. Now, our six hour curriculum included models on cultural competency, hormone therapies, gender confirming surgical procedures, mental health needs, health insurance coverage, including advocating for coverage of, of such expenses, 
uh, and a set of curated films themed on transgender experience across the lifespan. The lifespan. Each model was module was taught by Chicago-based nationally recognized experts in each of their relevant fields. You know, our wellness center has recently received funding from the Small Change Foundation to partner with the Brave Space Alliance, a Chicago-based Black-led, trans-led LGBTQ center to provide trans inclusivity trainings uh, for campus leaders. So we're gonna train uh, about 100 campus leaders in a four-hour uh, program uh, this coming May. The Brave Space Alliance's mission is to empower, embolden, and educate through mutual aid, knowledge sharing, and the creation of community source resources building toward the liberation of all oppressed peoples. Brave Space's Alliance's focus on intersectionality is particularly important as the trans experience is multifaceted and not monolithic. The first training in the series, Understanding uh, Transness, a Comprehensive Trans 101, is designed to offer a basic introduction to trans affirmation and discuss the critical issues faced by trans people. Trans 101 breaks down basic ideas about gender, do's and don'ts of interacting with trans people, the difference between sex and gender and the diversity of trans experience. A second training moves participants from understanding to action. Uh, the Understanding Trans Lives and Liberation uh, module provides a deeper understanding of the lived experience of trans people. Uh, the workshop addresses the complexities of transphobia and how the world is built to cater to cisgender people, as well as breaking down how to achieve trans liberation in the history of the trans liberation movement. And as you can sort of pick up, uh, the focus on intersectionality is, is so timely. Uh, all of the, the focus areas I'm talking about right now intersect with each other. And by focusing uh, on each of these, uh, uh, there's a multiplier effect, I think, that you create on a, on a campus. And the last thing I'll tell you about is our work in equity and mental health on campus. So we are partnering with the Steve Fund the leading advocacy organization for students of color and mental health on college campuses uh, to address the mental health and well beings of students of color on our campus through the Equity and Mental Health on Campus Initiative, the EMHC. Uh, the initiative works to transform campus climates, policies, and services and to support the mental health of students of color. Uh, this effort is supported at SAC by a gift from Blue Cross Blue Shield in Illinois. Uh, to accomplish this, we've built a steering committee of students, faculty, and staff who lead this initiative. Over 18 months, we're now four months in, uh, the steering committee will work with the Steve Fund to provide our faculty, administrators, and students with the support, tools, and resources necessary to address mental health needs at our campus. Through this initiative, we are part of a community of action to share responsibilities, build knowledge, make investments, innovate, and learn from each other. You know, the first cohort had 18 colleges and universities and the current one has 12. Uh, and this is something Michigan can join down the road at some point as well, if they haven't yet. Uh, the initiative is designed to address the significant inequities in mental health and disparities faced by students of color and to make the mental health of students of color a priority. Uh, I can tell you here in Chicago, the inequities have never been more apparent. Uh, the pandemic has uh, uh, revealed just the extreme extent to which uh, the health and medical, uh, or I'm sorry, mental health systems are inequitable for people of color. And, and efforts like this uh, counter those uh, tendencies on college campuses. Uh, the features of the effort include working with an expert coach assigned to our school, collaborating with the Steve Fund research experts to conduct a needs assessment and build a campus data toolkit, hosting listening sessions for students, constructing a campus racial narrative, and learning from the other cohort schools and regular gatherings and determining goals and recommendations to pursue in the service of improving mental health support for students of color on campus. Uh, so th those are the four things I wanted to really kind of uh, highlight, you know, maybe uh, sort of a, a part of each of those things and a, a, maybe a theme of this, this brief uh, presentation is that, you know, the external resources that uh, can be available to us on college campuses can make a huge difference uh, in us innovating and better meeting the needs of our, our student population. Uh, each of these things uh, that I just described, you relied on some kind of external funding and external partnership uh, that allows us to go beyond the regular day-to-day -day functioning of a wellness center, you know, a counseling health and disability service on campus, and, and to genuinely innovate 
and to expand the possibilities for how we support students on our, on our campuses. So uh, I, I can't uh, thank enough uh, efforts like the GLS uh, Campus Suicide Prevention Grants and the private philanthropy that we've benefited from and Blue Cross Blue Shield for delivering resources for our equity initiative. And you know, organizations large and small, the Small Change Foundation, things like bringing theory to practice. Uh, uh, the resources are out there. Uh, we always need more, but those kind of external partnerships really make a fundamental difference for us on college campuses. So uh, with all that said, I think uh, we're ready for the panel. That was fantastic, Joe, thank you. I, I learned quite a bit uh, just for myself and had no idea that all this was going on in campuses, I wish that some of that had been happening for myself, but there's always hope and I'm very encouraged by hearing everything that you talked about. So we should have really rich conversation um, a little later on. So right now we're going to uh, hear from, have each of our panelists introduce themselves. We have a wonderful panel today. Uh, the first one I would like is Eri. Eri, would you please introduce yourself and welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Eri. I'm a fifth year senior in LSNA, my majors are creative writing and literature with a double major in ecology, evolutionary biology, and biodiversity. I am also a comics artist and writer, and I currently live in East Quad. Thank you, Ari. And the next uh, panelist would be Hank. Hank, can you unmute yourself? Hey, Chris Van. Uh, I know a lot of the folks out there, so you know me. So I'm a psych counselor of many years. I was at the RC doing that for many years, as well as faculty. Um, I am now, thank God, retired <laughs> and spending a lot of time in theater than I more than I used to, doing plays, uh, both acting and writing. And I will say a bit about that in the context of our discussion to come. Fantastic. Thank you, Hank. And last but not least, uh, Andrew. Can we hear a little bit about you and introduce yourself, please? Definitely not least. Um, Absolutely. Anyways, <laughs> I'm Andrew. Uh, I, I graduated from the University of Michigan School of Social Work with my master's in social work in May 2020. So like right in the beginning of the pandemic. And then uh, I, I have a bachelor's from UC Berkeley in psychology and uh, you know, um, working a little bit. I'm working at Home Depot right now. Um, also a consumer of mental health services. And I guess, we'll, you know, I, I had a mental health crisis in college. So I guess we'll talk more, expand more if you want. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, we want this to be a, a space of exchange and learning today. Uh, so who wants to start us off with our panelists and in your um, response to our keynote today? Joe, who wants to start that out for us? Hank, you want to start that out for us? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to pick up on some general things. Um, a few words that Joe said. This is not the program part, but the words compassion, yes. the words belonging, and I'm going to add one other phrase which is vulnerability, and I mean appropriate vulnerability. Obviously, all of those things can be taken as fluff, right? Kumbaya comments. But in the age that we are obviously all in, characterized by divisiveness, another cliche, profound distrust, in my view, profound isolation for many, for geographic, I mean, for all the different reasons that is, and fear, the compassion, belonging, and appropriate vulnerability mean something, I think, differently than they did. And to the extent that it can, they can be actualized as virtues in this time in particular, that may have as much impact as anything on the wider picture. Of course, we want to attend to what happens and what we can do in response to individual people. But what happens between people may be at least as important. And I feel that especially now. And I, I mentioned earlier theater, it's for me is a kind of utopian example. You know, when you're working on a play, 
the creative collaboration, especially when things get going and you're working with actors and directors and putting things together. It's kind of like what Mark said, it's philosophy in the morning, poetry in the afternoon. That is in its best being in the zone. That is the kind of community. And whatever people are bringing by way of personal suffering, um, not always, of course, but people often can, to, in that moment at least, transcend and engage that sort of mini community of the production in the performance. So I take that for me as a model of what can be ideally, really in a utopian way, more broadly uh, actualized in an ideal world and so necessary now. And so from the performance, I go to the schmooze, as I would call it, that happens after the performance, which is at least as important as the performance itself, the ongoing conversation, and the conversation beyond that, beyond that. And I'll just end with this. Years ago, Ellis and A had one of their theme semesters, and I think it was called something like, What Makes Life Worth Living? Something like that. And we all got little postcards about our answers, and people said, you know, chocolate, and babies, and love, and all of those good things. But the only, what I thought of and what I wrote on my little postcard was what makes life worth living is schmoozing about what makes life worth living. And I say that because really, of course, whatever and wherever we are coming from and whatever we're dealing with, whatever burdens we carry and blessings that we also carry, uh, the chance to share, the chance to schmooze, the chance to sort it out together is for me, the bottom line. I'll just stop there. That was wonderful. Thank you. That was really good. Can we hear a little bit about from you, Andrew? What are your thoughts? What's coming up for you? Yeah, um, that's right on, Hank, um, about like schmoozing, about life. You know, like uh, when I was in college, I did a lot of, you know, drugs um like acid and mushrooms and like um it was like and then I, I would think I would have like existential questions about like what is the meaning of life and then like, I would always want to talk about that like those deep questions with people and no one very few people would have the capacity to be on my level you know and that's kind of what led to my mental breakdown and mental health crisis because I was just throwing out energy that wasn't being reciprocated and uh um yeah so it's it's better now you know after a couple hospitalizations medication years of therapy um um uh, you know and uh, a couple more degrees you know um you know just just more stable now um you know there's a time and place for those conversations you know it's not it's not just you know that was uh, just like just chill don't be as intense about it you know and um and like hank said it's it's just smoozing about the meaning of life or what makes life worth living you know like i i feel like we're intellectuals and we're uh we're uh like because we're all part of the university commu community and um we all you know like we're all trying to better life for everyone so um we like talking about these things and i guess language and talking about it is the only way we can understand and comprehend each other and have novel ideas you know because uh if you're if you're just by yourself you're just thinking the same thought over and over but if you're conversing with other people you have uh different ideas different thoughts different epiphanies you know so um my friend uh, i'll just close with this my friend uh uh you know he, he told me you know this has been our drug heyday um but like he's he just told me that like friends are better than drugs you know so um you know it's just like the conversations you have with people are what make life worth living and makes drugs experiences like even better but you can have those sober and the challenge is having those sober and 
um, and uh, yeah, it takes takes practice and yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Gary, what comes up for you after uh, Joe spoke and what he was speaking about? I know compassion came up for Hank and Andrew. Um, yeah, I just, I really like how we are synthesizing the uh, sy 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 systemic change on like a, coll a collegiate level with student groups and official programs sponsored by the university and also on an interpersonal interpersonal level with our peers, with the faculty, with the people around you in your everyday life. That can really make the difference to someone's mental health, just being kind and taking the time to just advocate for someone else. And I am going to share a personal story from my life to kind of drive that home. I am a transgender man. man. However, due to financial constraints and parental control, I have not been able to start testosterone yet and thus I do not pass very well, which means misgendering is kind of a daily occurrence for me, even from people who really mean well. So, but I was in this one class once and I was getting workshopped and there were a bunch of people uh, misgendering me in the comments in their letters to me. And it was, uh, incredibly hurtful but there was this one kid who spoke up for me and in her own letter like this is a public discussion post that like everyone could see she said hey just a reminder everybody uh this kid uses he him pronouns and then when she was presenting on my piece because she was supposed to lead the discussion the next day she also reminded everyone that hey this is a trans, this is a transgender man, please use he and pronouns for me. And no one has ever done that for me before. And I, we are not in contact anymore. I have no idea where this person is, but I will never forget that she stood up for me like that. Importantly, she didn't have to. This person was not trans. She could not know what this experience was like. And she did this for me. And I will never forget it because no one else has ever spoken up when I was being misgendered unless they were a very close friend or, and or also trans. So Priscilla Flores, if you're out there, thank you so much. What a beautiful story, Gary. And it was very brave and compassionate on her part, right? She showed you compassion. And that was very brave because you don't know what can happen with that. And as Hank was speaking earlier, we really are in this together. Maybe you spoke earlier when we were on practice, when we were practicing for the, for the webinar. Um, we're all in this together, right? And it just doesn't take much to just be concerned about our neighbor and someone else. I know the work that I do at NAMI, I, I won't prolong this, but I got there because um, I have, I live with in support of a loved one with a serious mental health condition. And I was just amazed at the people who were so compassionate and so kind and so understanding. When I got there, I was like, this is truly my tribe. No one looked like me though, right? So the, the, what, what kind of, what was the equalizer there is everyone was kind of suffering in their own way, but we understood each other at a deeper level because we understood what it was like to either live with a mental health condition or live in support of someone. And so it teaches me, people say, well, Judy, you give a lot of grace. That has taught me to have more compassion and understanding and a more open mind for others. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate that story, Gary. It was beautiful. And I, I hope you share that even more because people need to hear that because there are other people who want to speak up and sometimes can be very afraid to do so. So that's wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Anyone else have any, any last minutes before we go over and transition to the Q&A about what was discussed in the keynote? Yeah, I, think I just wanted to say something about just the comments made, of, made by uh, all of you. I, I just love the the highlighting of vulnerability. I, yes. I, more with you, Hank. I think it's it's critical. It, it, it I think as a concept, it's an emerging concept and virtue that's really never been more necessary. And the way that Andrew and Ari and and, and Ari and, and Judy, you just uh, demonstrated it here, was uh, very moving and and awesome. Uh, and it's just the other piece to this is uh, the interpersonal and what happens between people. It's so critical. You know, I think we can think too much about what's happening just 
individually inside ourselves and not enough about what happens between people. But I think that the most powerful interventions are those that do both, that help us to think and feel in a particular way, but always in connection to other people. Yeah. So, and I, I know that's what the RC does so well, day in, day out, 24 seven is the sense of connection and, and cultivating uh, the, the, these kind of kindness mm-hmm. and openness uh, between people. So I, I love that you just took those strands from what I said and, and delivered that. Yeah, it was great, great how that worked. So we're gonna transition a little bit here and look and see what we have in the Q and A. Um, and also for those who are with us today and listening, the Q and A, they are, are anonymous, so I will not be announcing your name. Uh, so please fill up that uh, Q and A uh, for us so we can get some of these questions answered. So the first one is, do you think our current culture with rising levels of expectation and speed of life will come to a breaking point? Hmm. Will we be able to inter- interpret it? What do you think we can do collectively to reduce our societal tolerance for these unsustainable elements that escalate mental health problems? So mm-hmm. who would like to address that? Yeah, so in other words, how do we save the world? Um, I, I don't think we have that answer. Um, again, I think what we can do is be as compassionate and responsive uh, along the way. It doesn't mean obviously there aren't things that we can do, but mental health obviously is one, one outcome, one facet of a wider catastrophe. I mean, I, I don't think there's a better word for it than that. Um, so in the midst of catastrophe, we do what we can do. One, there's a title I was well, recently have read, it's something called, I think it was Embracing Helplessness. And, you know, it sounds almost perverse. Why would you embrace helplessness? We're not helpless. Not totally, of course we're not. But it means the vulnerability that we really do experience. And I, I see in my colleagues' questions so much has to do with, so in their compassion, experience, what can I do to be more responsive and helpful to my students and so on? And that's what we try to do with the RC all the time. And that's important, obviously. But part of being helpful to them is not being only in the role of provider, of caretaker. There's also, again, our own helplessness, which we share. It's what Judy said, we are in this together. And whether we're faculty, whether we're students, whether we're staff, wherever we are, I'm speaking within the RC, we're all in this together. It doesn't mean we don't have separate roles. It doesn't mean there aren't boundaries. It doesn't mean all of those things that we know. But I think sometimes we get so fixed appropriately because it's our job to be helpful that we um, lose track of a degree of uh, sharedness that informs being helpful. In terms of Rob, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say the name. In terms of that big question, <laughs> wow. You know, I, you know, all I can say is the best we can. Jill? Something I might add is, you know, find, your, find something to uh, dive into that makes it different in terms of this kind of compassionate action. And, you know, a number of the things that I just talked about, hopefully that for many of you, if you don't know about these things, it might inspire you to learn more and potentially engage them. But, but I'll give you an example of like last semester, something that emerged for us uh, that gets to some of these issues is that uh, the Stanford uh, Sea Care program and a, a compassion-based program out of the University of Edinburgh that we've partnered with in the past, in the past came together to create an experience called Realizing a Compassionate Planet. And what it did was bring together uh, international leaders in compassion, uh, science and practice, and leaders uh, taking on uh, the climate crisis, including Jane Goodall was the keynote for that particular gathering. But we, our part in it was to create a virtual gallery that we called the Compassion and Action Gallery. And you know, our, the talented curator I mentioned earlier, who's an alum, Alex Stark, and part of our team, uh, took the lead with that. And we, we gathered a collection of artists, internationally renowned organizations, uh, and created this Compassion in Action Gallery within the two-day experience. And uh, I, I share this one because it's an example of uh, the ever-evolving and emerging uh, uh, efforts that we can engage. And, and the way that some of these 
coexist now together and, and feed off of each other. Compassionate action can help solve the climate crisis. Yeah. It was the principle of this gathering. So, so try to find something that grounds you and makes it feel like the, the swirl of pandemic, mm-hmm. climate crisis, you know, an ongoing challenge isn't, isn't constantly throwing you around and you can get your feet on the ground somehow or another. That's, I, I try to do that. And with our, our, our work here, we try to do that. Fantastic. I have another question, and I think I want to propose this to you, Joe, um, or all the panelists, but I'll start with you. What are your thoughts on potential of art making for supporting and sparking compassion and vulnerability? <laughs> nothing, I want to say nothing better right off the bat, uh, because, you know, creative expression you know, gets right to the heart of those matters. Genuine, I mean, it's an emotional engagement. It's an intellectual engagement. It's shared, you know, when we share work with other that, others that we're making, we're being vulnerable, we're being open, we're, we're delivering ourselves on, on multiple levels. Uh, and yeah, huge potential, huge power. Uh, and, you know, here we're an independent art school, so we function in the world. Uh, at a place like Michigan, you've got an art design school that can function on your campus and, and you can take classes and collaborate across disciplines, which is which is so critical. So the power is, you know, significant. Uh, there, was a recent, there was an article recently in the Inside uh, Higher Education that's worth thinking about that, that highlighted that within this pandemic, maker spaces are actually potential cures for the distress that the pandemic causes. It was an exciting article to read here because we're a campus of maker spaces. You know, we, people come here and make things in, in foundries and in painting studios and ceramic studios and, and uh, theater and performance departments. So uh, yeah, huge potential uh, in a way to get through these times to and to, to expand how we might approach the challenges on every level. Fantastic. I wanna, did you have something, Ari? Oh, yes, if that's all right. Yeah, please do. The simplest way I can solve it up, sum it up, is that art increases our capacity for empathy. And when you, I mean, I'm a creative writer, I'm a comic writer, I read a lot of comics, I read a lot of books, and they teach, they, books, fiction especially, makes you care about people, about places, about crises and in a world where the news cycle will try to where the news cycle and the events in our everyday lives will try to drag us down and demoralize us fiction inspires hope it inspires compassion for people who are different than you it shows you all you can be and all society can be if you just work for it and reach for it and i think that's what makes art and story is so important. Very important. That is so brilliantly said, Ari. And you know what? Uh, we have a, a comics, especially right now, are tremendously helpful. I think within the pandemic, some, some people uh, that that medium is is really delivering uh, as time people are challenged with time. Uh, but I hope everyone on this panel can get see your work somehow. Do you have a website? Yeah, we can find it. Uh, I have a Tumblr. Okay. Right. That would be really cool. Yeah. Oh, I so hope we can research what you're doing and, and see it firsthand. Fantastic. We'll drop it in the chat. Please do. That's perfect. Hank and Andrew, did you have something to comment about that? The the creative side? Okay. You guys, All yeah, right. I said it earlier. All right. So um, go ahead. I have something to say. Um, the creative side. Um, yeah. I guess I do some stand-up comedy too, but I, I wanted to address the last question about um, what can we do um, for like mental illness. I think the best thing we can do is to break the stigma, you know, um, uh, you know, like talk about mental struggling and vulnerability, appropriate vulnerability. You know, there's, I think it's getting better with future generations, you know, um, you know, they talk about how like millennia, uh, generation Z or something is all about, 
uh you know like oh i have a therapist don't you you know like it's just like normalizing mental health conversations and currently you know 25 percent of people have or 20 percent i don't know it's around there have mental illness but uh it'd probably be like around 100 percent in 50 100 years you know like just like it's just something to describe people and you know the way jimmy carter described it um he said like you know, the, the United States was so torn from like Vietnam and, you know, all those like wars that we had, um, you know, the battle isn't outside of us anymore. It's in, internal, you know, that's, that's what he, that's what he described it. He wasn't a great president, but he was a good post president. That's what I heard. Um, so it was just like, you know, just, you know, something to chew on, you know. So Andrew, I noticed when I was reading your bio a bit, and so it lets me to this other question that someone asked is what's the biggest positive impact on your mental health? What has been the biggest positive impact on your mental health in your life? Definitely uh, comedy, you know, um, I do stand up comedy, but uh, I don't think that's that's great. That helped me like learn public speaking, um, which is important. But I feel like what helped me recover from my deepest darkest times was being able to laugh at myself and or laugh in general um they said they they say laughter is the best medicine and you know of course it won't cure cancer or something but it it probably will cure like mental illness you know depression if you're able to laugh at yourself then you know life isn't so serious and you're not as sad anymore you know i can personally attest to that i had schizo a schizophrenic breakdown and I was watching a Chris Rock YouTube clip and he was just cracking jokes and I was just stone faced at first. And then I started to smile and then I started to giggle and then started to laugh and it started to belly laugh. And, and after the 10 minute YouTube clip was up, I was just like, OK, you know, like life is going to be all good. You know, like it's it'll be OK. So, um, yeah, comedy really saved my life. Chris Rock saved my life. <laughs> So uh, he's he's my they're they're my go to yeah fantastic. Erin, I'm gonna go back to you, and I'm gonna come back to Hank. So, what are some of the how can we best support students and their mental health during these times? What are what are your thoughts on that? You talked a little bit about the arts and that kind of thing, but I think one of the best things we can do is try to increase accessibility whatever ways we can is it is always hard for marginalized groups to get the support and the access they need but it's even harder during the pandemic and we need to be able to like understand understand the overlap the overlapping needs of different marginalized communities i think uh, we really on a systemic level we need to overhaul student disability services okay. it is incredibly difficult currently to go through all the paperwork to get accommodations. In fact, at the beginning of last year, they cleared their databases and everyone who formerly had accommodations lost them and had to reapply, which can be an incredibly difficult and taxing process, depending on your disability, depending on how much documentation you have, and depending on if your disability is mental and related to trauma, like obviously talking about that is not fun. So we need to take care of, we need to work on how SDS operates. Uh, I would like to see more gender neutral bat bathrooms incorporated throughout campus. Currently, I don't even freaking know if there's one in Angel. I have never been able to find it. So for non-binary students who can't use uh, gendered bathrooms, that's like kind of a big deal. Or for trans students who don't feel safe going into the bathroom with assigned to gender identity. I know for me, the USB, which is where I work, recently put in a gender neutral bathroom on the second floor, and it's been a world of difference not having that anxiety going into, go, having to go into a room and be like, okay, am I going to get jumped? Is someone going to like question my presence wow. here when I am just trying to take a pee at work? Yeah. So I think now, as always, accessibility is incredibly important. We also need to work on more long-term care solutions. Currently, LSNA grants only will allow for like 10 weeks of therapy. Right. And for a lot of people, and it, 
it prioritizes short-term problems. A lot of problems aren't short-term. Like crisis management is great, but we all, crisis management is great and incredibly important. We also need to like address the root of the crisis. Yes. That's fantastic. Thank you. Anyone else? And I want to talk about where, where time or we're running, not running out of time. We're going to go a little over um, for folks. Um, but I want to know how faculty, parents, and siblings can be helpful uh, during these diff difficult times, especially for those who are living with a mental health condition. Mm -hmm. I can speak from my own personal experience. Um, I believe that families sometimes don't understand so just getting that education on what mental illness is, what it looks like, different, different diagnoses, and really being a listener. Uh, I had my um, family member explain to me what they were actually feeling and going through, which helped me better understand it because a lot of times it's so misunderstood because everyone is different in how they navigate with their own, who they are and if, if, if they have a mental health condition, a brain disorder, it doesn't come out the same way as it would in someone else. Like everyone is different. Everyone brings something different to the table. So how can faculty, parents, students, siblings help, um, especially during these times? Any, um, anything, anyone want to share? Yeah, Judy, I would just basically reiterate. So I won't, <laughs> what you just said, because I think to me, that was the, the essence of it. My wife and I recently watched the movie of Dear Evan Hansen, you know, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier that whatever else one says and it's their divided uh, takes on the film, unlike the play, but you know, the moment when everyone is saying you are not alone and that just sort of takes off and you know, just watching it, it's incredibly moving. Uh, I think for most people when, when they're watching the, the, the different specific things that Ari was talking about paying attention to what the hell kind of bathrooms do we have? Yes. What does it say? I mean, it's one thing, as I did earlier, to talk about compassion in this sort of broad way, but that comes down to specific policy as well. If, we're to, if we mean you are not alone, it means responding to particulars as well as that can be done. And some of that is policy, some of it is what's on the door, some of it's what's who's in the building, some of it is other kinds of programming, and some of it is, Judy, as you said, is responding to individuals. My sister was, she would say, no, I'm not a schizophrenic. I was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Yeah, okay. And indeed, and this was a long discussion and we all know where that goes and it's so important. Um, so in our compassion, in our trying to create belonging and people feeling less alone, especially in these times, uh, that's not only, you know, a choral hymn, it comes down to particular decisions, particular programs. And, you know, this is, yeah, it's, it's about family, I guess, on one level, it's really, again, to me, maybe that's in some families, the first line, and some families, it's the last line. <laughs> I mean, it depends on the family, right? Sometimes it's teachers, sometimes it's friends, sometimes it's aunts and uncles who are not immediate family. So, yeah, I mean, or a bystander. Where, yeah, or whoever on a plane, wherever you can find it. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, yeah and what I, what I would add is uh, for family members and faculty, engage actively, uh, sensitively and respectfully, but engage. You know, it's rare that there's a problem caused by uh, overreacting to a loved one's or a student's challenges. Uh, the, it's much more problematic to underreact, I do. Absolutely. At the time. And, and, you know, that the, the professionals on campuses are here to help you figure out how to engage to be supportive as a student moves through a college experience. That's, that's our job. So consult, engage, uh, and let us help you help your loved ones. And in, nowadays, a campus community more than ever, obviously, um, maybe not so obviously, but I, I, I hope it becomes more obvious, families matter. Uh, we, we engage our families very proactively, very actively, and uh, typically to great benefit of uh, the students we're serving. Absolutely. This has been fantastic. Any final remarks from anyone before I hand this over to uh, for uh, to Liz? Nothing. Well, thank you very much, and I'm going to have uh, Liz come on and uh, give us her closing remarks. This has been fantastic. Thank you all so much. Um, usually, 
the Robertson is a single person lecturing. And uh, this hour we've just had was really designed unscripted. Um, but that's kind of how connections happen. You know, you can't rehearse them. And I just want to thank all the folks who showed up in to listen and also, you know, the panelists and the speaker and the moderator, because uh, I think each of you <clears throat> really shared, expressed a unique creativity. You know, honestly, Joe, applying for grants and getting <laughs> programs such as you described, sometimes by acronyms, I can't remember, that is really hard work and tedious and exhausting. Um, but you were really upbeat about the fact that these can make a difference. They are public programs and they aren't a one-on-one -on -one thing, but they can turn into that kind of thing. Um, Andrew, I know you were sick today. I can't believe <laughs> you've shown a lot of bravery to come on anyway. You had to be here because as, as I've said to you before, you have a droll voice that calms me down. I mean, you somehow have learned how to express yourself uniquely. And I just want a connection to watch you as a, as a stand-up comic. I've heard you as a mental health consumer and I now use that uh, handle all the time. It's brilliant. And, and Ari shouting out to Priscilla Flores, I'm telling her that was great that you did that. <laughs> you named her. That was great. Uh, I and all I could, what? I wasn't going to for the anonymity. <laughs> oh, well, she deserves it. She, she deserves does. to be outed and shouted. Yeah. And uh, Hank, I begged you, and please put it in the chat Remnants, a world famous film about the Holocaust, you didn't talk about yourself as a playwright, but if you put that in the chat, people can follow the incredible his oral historian of the Holocaust. You're famous, but the really important point is your pioneering work has made such a difference in people understanding this phase of history, of lived experience, of what trauma means, and you've combined that so brilliantly with your career at the RC. So anyway, I just wanna say, <clears throat> Unique creativity. I've been trying to think about mine. I, <laughs> you know, we have to dig deep sometimes. Maybe our talents, our creativity is hidden. I think mine might, I, you know, a lot of times I just want to wrap presents these days. I don't know. Is that, is that art wrapping presents? Thank you. I see you nodding. Because I really, in the pandemic, it, it satisfies me so much like to wrap presents. And I also really like conversations like getting people together like you guys. And so anyway, um, you've really encouraged us to dig inside ourselves for our unique talents, unique. There's nobody else like each of you. And I, I'm so grateful the Residential College is offering this winter series on mental health and the arts. And I just wanna use this last moment to invite everybody to the follow-up event, March, 29th, Tuesday, 7 to 8, on, again, you said it was a mouthful, Joe, but this is more of a mouthful, Incarceration, Confinement, and Mental Health, the Visual Arts as a Practice of Inner Freedom. And the participants will include Jillian Eaton and Andy Krishner, the producers of Team Wristband, the film that was mentioned. And they'll talk about the uses of imaging, including animation, within the film that they made. Uh, Janie Paul, author of a forthcoming book on prison art and co-founder with Buzz Alexander of the Prison Creative Arts Program at University of Michigan. Since 10 times the number of people who are mentally ill reside in jails or in mental hospital or holding zones within jails, this is a subject of immense importance. I don't think I need to say anything more, but Janie's going to speak about not just her forthcoming book, but the preverbal infant and the role of mirroring and of art in human development. And they're going to be joined by Danny Valentine and Joe Summers as respondent and moderator. So I'd just like to close with a quotation that uh, my stepbrother Clint Van Dusen sent me from Desmond Tutu from an African prayer book. 
We are made to live in a delicate network of interdependence with one another. We say in our African idiom, a person is a person through other persons. A solitary human being is a contradiction in terms. A totally self-sufficient human being is ultimately subhuman. We are made for complementarity. I have gifts that you do not, and you have gifts that I do not. Voila. We, so we need each other to become fully human. Thank you everybody so much for coming, for speaking, for asking, for sharing. Uh, try and come on the 29th of March. Bye-bye. Thank you. Peace out. <laughs>